made congressional delegations to Taiwan over the years, and the normal practice of friends visiting each other is inherent in our culture of hospitality. Military exercises are unnecessary sponsors. Taiwan has always been open to constructive dialogue, and we will work with stakeholders to bring about stability and peace in the region. Thank you very much, Madam and President. And now I'm honored to give the floor to Speaker Pelosi to deliver her remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Mack. Military for your leadership, uh, and for the leadership Taiwan has always gathered been here with you today. Dialogue. I'm proud of my delegation. We're almost like one unit, uh, in the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, the chairman of the Thank you very much, Madam President. President. And now I'm honored to give the floor to Speaker Pelosi to deliver her remarks. Excuse me. Thank you very much. Ways and means that the Trade Committee uh, Congressman Susan Del Bene, a member of the Intelligence Committee, Mr. Christian Murphy, and a member of the Foreign Affairs and Armed Services Committee, Mr. Kim. I say that because when I speak, uh, I thank you very much, Madam President, for your kind words, as well as the invitation to the and appreciated by ways and means that the trade committee on both sides of the aisle, both sides of the Bene, a member of great enthusiasm for the U.S. Taiwan of the Let's just put it in respect over four decades, committee, Mr. Kim. I say the Foreign Relations Act was built in building a strong bond between the world, advancing our shared interests of government, economy, and security, while respecting the one China. Our solidarity is now more important than ever as the U.S. and the relations. In our bilateral meeting, we discussed key opportunities to deepen our partnership. I say upholding democracy and human rights and respect the individuals on that well, I'll get around to the three areas that I just mentioned, security, respecting the economy, government, security, our relationship is a strong one, and we're discussing how we are going to make it stronger. And Now you're watching SD Live, Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen Ing and U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi are currently giving a joint news conference after holding talks this morning. Now we are facing some technical difficulties, but we will bring you the news conference soon. Now, earlier today, uh, both lawmakers held talks and in remarks made earlier during the meeting, Ms Tsai said that Mrs Pelosi is one of Taiwan's pivotal friends and she has offered Taiwan her unwavering support. Now, Ms Tsai also making reference to China's displeasure at the U.S. Speaker's visit, saying that Taiwan will not back down in the face of military threats. Right now, what uh, you are seeing are live pictures of Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen and U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi giving a joint news conference. And now we're facing some technical difficulties, but we will bring you the news conference soon. Earlier today, Ms Tsai and Mrs Pelosi had a meeting and in remarks made during the meeting, Ms Tsai said that Mrs Pelosi is one of Taiwan's pivotal friends and she has offered Taiwan her unwavering support. Ms Tsai also making reference to China's displeasure at the US Speaker's visit saying that Taiwan will not back down in the face of military threats. As for Mrs Pelosi, she says the US treasures its relationship with Taiwan and the story of Taiwan is an, inspirational to, is an inspiration to all freedom-loving people. She concluded by saying that US solidarity with Taiwan is more crucial than ever. 
Again, you are seeing live pictures of Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen and US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi giving a news conference. Now we're facing a bit of uh, technical difficulties, uh, but we will bring you the news conference. Now we are cutting back to the scene of the news conference. You're the first House Speaker to visit Taiwan in 25 years. So do you foresee that your visit will bring up even more similar high senior official U.S. Front, uh, to visit Taiwan in the future or maybe future speakers? Uh, this is the first part of my question. And the second part is, uh, in accordance with Taiwan Travel Act, uh, high-level visits are two-way thing. So a lot of uh, U.S. congressmen ha has proposed uh, President Tsai to speak at U.S. Congress, if possible. Do you see that it could realize anytime soon in the near future, especially under your leadership in the House? And the final question is, <laughs> I'm sorry, 25 <laughs> years again, sorry. The final question is, uh, how do you see how the Chinese welcome you with uh, military exercise and sanctions against Taiwan. Do you foresee that? Thank you. Well, first let me thank you for your questions on behalf of all of those other people. And um, to say that uh, in terms of our visit here, and would that lead to other visits, I certainly hope so. But I think it's important to note that pe members of Congress, several of them had made trips just earlier this year. Five senators, bipartisan, came, again, including the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, Mr. Menendez, came. Not too much of a fuss was made. Sen individual senators have made trips or plan to make trips. And uh, I just hope uh, that uh, it's really clear that while China has stood in the way of Taiwan participating and going to certain meetings, that they understand that they will not stand in the way of people coming to Taiwan. It's a show of friendship, of support, but also a source of learning about how we can work together better in collaboration. So, it, yeah, no, I, I don't, I think that, that um, they made a big fuss because I'm speaker, I guess. I don't know if that was a reason or an excuse because they didn't say anything when the men came. <laughs> uh, what's the second part was uh, the second part was invited to the U.S. Congress to make well, that was the third part but I'll go there okay. okay that was the third part I thought uh, we haven't had a joint session in probably three years in Congress uh, partially because of COVID, but even before that, it was Christmas and all that. So we haven't had many uh, joint sessions, but we have tried to accommodate visits uh, by bringing together, um, bringing together both sides of the aisle and, and both sides of the Capitol. And I would hope that uh, that, that opportunity would be there. Uh, the joint session has become something Again, because of COVID, we can't, we aren't able to do it. It's even hard for us to do the President's State of the Union address because you have to space and you have to time and, well, you know, here we are. The, uh, I don't know, um, uh, I think that whatever China was going to do, they will do in their own good time. What excuse they may use to do it is another thing, but you really know more about that than I do. Uh, I do think that, um, the, uh, it's really important uh, for the message to be clear that in the Congress, House and Senate, Democrats and Republicans are committed to the security of Taiwan in order to have Taiwan be able to most effectively defend themselves. Uh, but it also is about our shared values of democracy and freedom and how Taiwan has been an example to the world in that regard. And. Uh, but there are certain insecurities on the part of the president of China as to his own political situation that he's rattling a saber. I don't know. But I really, it doesn't really matter. What matters to us 
is that we salute the successes of Taiwan. We work together for the security of Taiwan, and we just take great lessons from the democracy in China. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Right now, we uh, take questions from the international media, and I would like to invite Samson Ellis. He is the Taipei Bureau Chief of Bloomberg News. Samson? Okay. Oh, thank you. Madam President, Madam Speaker, we have seen the Chinese authorities take multiple economic actions against individual Taiwanese companies and entire sectors of the economy here. Taiwan has already paid a cost for your visit and is likely to continue to do so over the coming days and weeks. What concrete, tangible benefits can you promise Taiwan to offset the cost of your trip? Well, you. at the same time as this trip is taking place and in recognition of our common interest economically, we just passed the Chips and Science Act. Uh, this is something that opens the door for us to, again, have good, better economic exchanges. I know that some Taiwan businesses, significant ones, are already planning to invest in manufacturing in the United States. And uh, the ingenuity, the entrepreneurial spirit, the, the brain power, <laughs> wherever, uh, the intellectual resource that exists in, in Taiwan and the success of the tech industry here for one, for one, um, one sector uh, has been really uh, a model. And again, we want to increase our relationship. So I think that it, I would be saying we would, that would be a goal we share, but with the CHIPS Act, we're really facilitating reaching uh, that goal. And to, uh, it, it's, it's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting. And I think that you will see um, uh, a uh, recognition of the scientific success uh, that Taiwan has had uh, being a model for how we go forward. That's why our bill is called CHIPS and Science. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Right now, uh, last but not the least, uh, we will have a representative from the Japanese media, Mr. Ishido Koichiro-san. He is the Bureau Chief of Asahi Shimbun of Japan. Hello. Hello, Speaker Pelosi. Konnichiwa. Thank you very much for taking my question. And my question is about the Chinese democracy. Now we are witnessing the Chinese authorities uh, increasing various pressures not only to Taiwanese people and the Hong Kongese, but to their own citizens, I mean the Chinese people. And uh, as a strong and long-time advocate of democracy, please let us share your ideas how the democratic countries, including South Korea, Japan, where you are heading to, can deter China from invading Taiwan militarily, and how we can guide China towards a democratic political system. Thank you. Well, two things. In the context, your question comes in the context of right now a, a struggle between autocracy and democracy in the world. We cannot back away from that. And so as China goes and uses its soft power, money and whatever, uh, into many countries in order to get their support at the UN and other bodies, we have to recognize if that has some effectiveness because it's a lot of money and it's um, promises that may or may not ever be kept. So when we talk about Taiwan in that context, we have to talk from strength. We have to talk from strength. We have to talk from uh, what, China, what Taiwan has been so good about is being technologically advanced, whether it's in business or security. And uh, we have to show the world, and that's one of the purposes of our trip, to show the world the success of the people of Taiwan, their courage, their courage to change their own country to become more democratic, 
they become more democratic, uh, their respect for people and the rest, and quite frankly, a model in this region in that respect, in those respects. So strength, uh, goodwill, and again, the demonstration of a democracy that has evolved to a stronger place now and it offers a very strong contrast to what's happening on mainland China. No more evidence needed than what happened in Hong Kong under one country, two systems. It didn't happen. But again, we're not here to talk about mainland China. We're here to talk about Taiwan. We have our uh, U.S. our Taiwan Relations Act. We support the communiques, this, that, and the other thing that have gone before. So we're not, we're, we are supporters of the status quo and the rest. Um, we don't want anything to happen to Taiwan by force. So strength, and, and one of the biggest sources of strength is democracy. I said at a meeting earlier with the parliamentarians, in our earliest days of our founding of our country, Benjamin Franklin, our presidency, said, freedom and democracy. Freedom and democracy, and one thing, security here. If we don't have, we can't have either if we don't have both. So, security, economics, eco security, economy, and again, they're all, and governance, they're all related, and we want Taiwan to always have freedom with security. And we're not backing away from that. Okay? Thank any, you very Alice, much. Anything you'd like to add to anything? Okay. Thank you so very much, ladies and gentlemen. Today's event is especially important because we are witnessing the historical visit of Speaker Pelosi to Taiwan to convey the message of the U.S. support to Taiwan. So we know in a challenging time like this, Taiwan is not alone. We also would like to thank very specially to President Tsai Ing-wen for her leadership, her resilience, strength, and wisdom show in leading Taiwan. Also, our sincere appreciation goes to the distinguished members of the U.S. Congress who accompanied Speaker Pelosi in her trip. And your friendship means a lot to us. Thank you so much for being here in Taiwan. Also, thanks for the presence of so many officials from uh, the U.S. side, from the Taiwan side, whose effort made this event possible. Thank you also very much to the media friends with us today and also hundreds right now watching the live transmission. Thank you very much to you all. Have a great day. We've been watching the news conference by Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen and U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. For more, I'm joined by Associate Professor Simon Tay, who is the Chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. Welcome to the show, Professor. Mrs Pelosi's visit has attracted strong words from China, which overnight has also taken certain steps, like summoned the US ambassador, announced a targeted military operation and a ban on sand exports to Taiwan. What do you think are the factors at play that will affect whether the fallout will be limited to what we have already seen or whether China's reaction could go further? And if so, how much further, Prof? I think the key part is to understand that both President Biden and Xi just had a dialogue specifically focused on this potential visit. Uh, and really, I think that this was a step to try to establish some expectations or to use the American term, guardrails. Uh, Biden must have been honest, I hope, and said that he cannot, as president, stop Pelosi as an independent House speaker. Uh, and in this sense, uh, he has laid the ground uh, to where America hopes China will react. But now, frankly, we are depending on China to be prudent. I mean, people must expect that uh, President Xi must respond. Uh, he's got an appointment to a third term coming up. Uh, there is a strong nationalistic sentiment in China that is beyond anyone's control over social media. And there are also elements of the military buildup and the military wishes to flex its muscles as it has been uh, quite continually over the last few years. So in this sense, uh, uh, we are depending on China 
while registering a very strong point to stop that from really becoming too much by compared to previous expectations. So Mrs. Pelosi said in a statement that her visit was one of several congressional delegations to Taiwan and in no way contradicts long-standing United States policy. Could you give us your take on that? Well, I think, first of all, it must be said that as of today, America, like all of us, still holds to the one China policy. And Pelosi visit doesn't change that most fundamental uh, 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 statement. However, there is a bit of a contextual shift. Uh, first, in American domestic politics, whether you're Republican or Democrat, as Pelosi and Biden are, there's been a very strong anti-China sentiment. And there have been questions of whether the current administration has been too soft on China. It is only a minority of people who want America to be prudent. A lot of people are beating up uh, on China over different issues like the Uyghurs, Hong Kong, and Taiwan is simply one of a long list of complaints they have about China. And there's also this question of drumbeat of autocracy and democracy, and an analogy to Ukraine, uh, its invasion by Russia, which Speaker Pelosi has played out. And this is not very helpful, nor accurate, and frankly, it sounds a bit tone deaf to many of us in Asia. Uh, Pelosi herself is really not an ardent Taiwan supporter on record. So really, I think there is a degree of, frankly, opportunism for the midterm elections coming up. And if domestic calculations are right, after the midterm elections, it's unlikely she will no longer be the House Speaker. So this is the timing that uh, Pelosi has to do what she wants to do uh, if she's going to do anything the newspapers and others will really react to. Uh, but to be a bit critical, I think the Biden administration has not been that helpful. While their policy has also not been changed overnight, there have been gaffes, so-called gaffes by Biden, uh, ending the question of strategic ambiguity by saying they will defend Taiwan against invasion, as opposed to the Taiwan Act, which just requires America to assist Taiwan to defend itself. And I and, and think this also builds up on uh, the tr precedents that were set by the previous Trump administration, where, again, cabinet-level uh, appointees would visit Taiwan. And so I think there is, in this sense, this contextual shift which China has been responding to and must see that Pelosi's uh, uh, visit is now just one more uh, uh, sort of, you know, one more uh, pawn or one more rook placed on a chessboard. Reactions to Mrs. Pelosi's visit outside of China have been mixed. Uh, Russia condemns it, but even in the US, uh, some, some commentators have called it unwise, even though there is some support within Washington. Professor, what do you think is its impact on Taiwan's interests on regional security and a broader geopolitical environment? Well, if I may, let me start with Taiwan. I mean, we mustn't treat Taiwan like a blank space where just we talk about China and America and the rest of us. I mean, Taiwan uh, is an a, 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 a entity which has really striven for uh, space in the world. And there's a long historical record uh, of its role and its friendship with my country, Singapore. So I do have a degree of sympathy for them. I feel this particularly because they have felt increasing pressure from the mainland and the Chai Ing-wen government has been really unable to get a channel open to Beijing, unlike the KMT before them. So for them and a lot of people who support this idea of the green movement uh, to have a status quo uh, de facto uh, separation from the mainland, uh, they feel increasing pressure. And so they have played this up uh, and we must, in a sense, understand and almost ignore what the very free Taiwanese press will say about the, the standing together of democracy, et cetera. For the rest of us, in a sense, we, we, we all have to live with the outward imbalances that result from these domestic politics, the domestic policy of China, in the US, and in Taiwan itself. And we just have to deal with it, uh, again, to keep calm, to see that things uh, do not head in the nasty direction of actual conflict, but to see even military exercises, in a way, as forms of protests, of statements by actions but not necessarily uh, actions of war. Uh, the ASEAN ministers meeting 
and the ASEAN Regional Forum are going on at this moment in Cambodia. And hopefully this can play a role to actually open some dialogue or at least give vent to some of the uh, anguish and strong statements that will come out. Professor, thank you so much for your time and perspectives. Associate Professor Simon Tay, Chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. Thank you. Let's Let now bring in the Straits Times' US Bureau Chief Nirmal Ghosh and China correspondent Elizabeth Law. Nirmal, Elizabeth, just moments ago, we heard the news conference uh, between Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen as well as uh, US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Your initial reaction to what has transpired during the news conference, anything in particular that stood out for you? Let's start with you, Nirmal. Well, I know I don't think there were any surprises except that she went to great lengths in, in terms of, uh, you know, talking about democracy and all that. I, I think she may have made a couple of slips when she referred to Taiwan as a country. Uh, that is called, probably going to be noticed by some people. But it was a message that we all expected her to deliver, given her record. You know, that she has been a sort of advocate uh, for democracy in the past. She is, uh, she's visited um, uh, Be uh, Beijing and you know, at Tiananmen Square and so forth. She has visited with the Dalai Lama and so forth. So her record on this is well known. And uh, she's, she wrote a big piece in the Washington Post just, just yesterday, I think, in which she outlined why she is making this visit. And, and she basically repeated all uh, the aspects, basically, you know, that uh, she made the point, and that's an important point, that the Taiwan Relations Act has been there for 43 years, a long time, and has had consistent bipartisan support in the U.S. Congress. So the U.S. is fairly, is pretty committed to it. I think, I think that was, I think she made all the points that she has already made in the past. Elizabeth, what about you? Anything that uh, stood out for you, Liz? I think what really stood out, like um, Nirmal said, it's not not unexpected. The, the you know that sort of very strong language that Mrs. Pelosi used, but uh, for sure, you know, it was it was very noteworthy that she referred to Taiwan as a country. Uh, that's one, and the other was the fact that Taiwanese President Tsai Ing Wen uh, was very measured in the statements that she made. She didn't take any question, but she did say at the top of the press availability that the military exercises that are going on around Taiwan. Taiwan now are completely unnecessary. Uh, do note that, you know, this morning, even beginning from last night, China had a furious response uh, from at least five different government bodies, beginning with the foreign ministry, the defense ministry. It, had, it is also conducting military exercises around Taiwan now. But this actually continued this morning. We were seeing more angry responses. The foreign minister has called um, the visit dangerous and stupid and also the Taiwan Affairs Office has now warned specifically uh, President Tsai and Mrs Pelosi that basically what they're doing now is going to lead Taiwan down a dangerous abyss. Uh, but what more we're expecting to see from China, I think it will unfold in the coming hours. Nirmal, you know, we're reading a lot of developments uh, from the China's uh, side as well as Taiwan. Can you bring us up to date on the reactions in Washington over the last 14 hours or so? Is there unanimity in opinions uh, towards the trip? And how will it play out domestically, especially in view of the midterms coming up? Well, uh, the US officially, the White House, uh, the Pentagon has actually... Um uh, come out and uh, repeated, number one, it does not change the uh, the One China policy. So there's no need to get excited. No, no, no drama is required. Uh, they think that China is overreacting. Uh, they will not rise to the bait. They will not do their own saber rattling, but they remain committed to uh, the Taiwan Relations Act and the whole thing. But the, the speaker's visit does not change anything fundamentally. That is the uh, administration's position. Now, if you look generally at um, at, uh, at at the the foreign policy and security establishment, there it started with this visit. A lot of people thought it was unnecessary and needlessly provocative. However, uh, it eventually drew bipartisan support, as we know. So I think that it sort of emboldened uh, emboldened the speaker, and um, the um, the point is made that there is precedent. Newt Gingrich, 
formerly Speaker of the House, a Republican, he visited in 97. So underlying the U.S.'s position is something which is somewhat akin, and, and you know, uh, Elizabeth, you can correct me if I'm wrong. The U.S. sort of believes that China is attempting to change the baseline or establish a new red line, right? Because this is not the China of 1997. So when the U.S. Uh, trots out all these reasons, there's precedent, there's no change to the one China policy, from the China point of view, that is disingenuous, right? So that, that, that's, where, that's where you have the uh, dissonance and set against a much larger relationship, which has frankly become rather toxic. And a lot of people are extremely worried about the direction this relationship is going in. Now, in terms of domestic politics and the midterms, uh, President Biden cannot afford to look soft on China. He, he is already often accused of appeasing China. And this is because right in the beginning when the news of the, of the Pelosi visit came out, he said the military thinks it's not a good idea and so forth. So he got a, he got a lot of criticism and that put himself, he put him in a corner where he could not really put pressure on and, and make and try and make Pelosi call off the trip. Of course, there's an element of, of practical and plausible deniability and distance because it is a fact that in the US system, the Speaker of the House uh, these are co-equal branches of government. The Speaker of the House can absolutely make her own decisions and go wherever she wants. And the President does not have the power to make her, uh, him or her, <clears throat> do anything. So the dilemma that President Biden finds himself in is that he has to look strong on China for, because of the midterms. And, and even, even beyond the midterms, there is bipartisan support for being tough on China. So. President Biden is, America is suffering under very high inflation. One of the things he could do is uh, relax some of the, uh, the tariffs on China, but he can't do that because he'll be accused of being soft on China. So he's caught in a bit of a bind. Be allowing this thing to, hap to happen, uh, allowing Nancy Pelosi to go there and all this stuff to happen, uh, is, doesn't harm the Democrats' prospects in the midterms at all. It would be worse if he was seen to be appeasing China and allowing China, China to, um, from the U.S. point of view, set these new red lines. Elizabeth, the latest uh, I am reading is, uh, according to Taiwan Defense Ministry, uh, Chinese drills have invaded Taiwan's territorial space. Now, separately, uh, China has hit Taiwan economically as well. Uh, China's Commerce Ministry has suspended the export of sand to Taiwan and halted the import of fruits and fish products from Taiwan. Uh, Elizabeth, what other leverage does it have? Well, I think, um, you know, just to add on slightly to what Nirmal had said earlier as well, this Chinese response has actually been completely uh, expected the, because of the rhetoric that was going in leading up to Mrs. Pelosi's visit, there was no way that China could not not respond in this very strong manner. And bear in mind the fact that this is also an important year. We are just months away uh, from the 20th Party Congress where President Xi is expected to seek a third term. Now, the fact is that President Xi's position is probably already set, but within your Politburo Standing Committee of that 25 top uh, political slots in China, those positions may not have been confirmed yet. And, you know, there is worry that if he isn't seen as being tough on Taiwan and being tough against um, America, and bear in mind, Taiwan is a very emotional issue for a lot of Chinese uh, because of historical reasons. And if he isn't seen as being tough in that way, there is a, a chance that, you know, other people would use this incident to try and jockey uh, for their own people to be put within the Politburo Senate Committee, so which is why this response has been absolutely necessary. Now, to go back to what you said yesterday, uh, China's customs has said that they are also going to ban the import of citrus fruits and certain types of fish uh, from Taiwan. They previously already banned uh, pineapples. They've banned groupers. And on Monday, they said that about 100 exporters from Taiwan were not allowed to export food into China because of outdated paperwork. So all, the, all of these is gradually tightening the screws. Are there more ways of them tightening the economic screws? 
Absolutely. Um, but what exactly they will do, because it, it is also quite a delicate balance. You want, you want to gradually have economic sanctions, but at the same time, you do not want to provoke them into really properly lashing out and, and really souring the entire relation. Because don't forget, China keeps pushing this thing as well that, you know, the, there is one country, two systems. And they need to try to make the idea of some sort of reunification palatable to the Taiwanese. So they don't want to, they really don't want to completely sour that uh, relationship. So I think it will be interesting to see what happens in the coming days and whether or not the the military exercises are going to escalate much further than we think. Uh, yes, while they have incurred into Taiwan, Taiwanese territory, but based on a map that the PLA had released last night after they announced the exercises that were going to take place this week, you could see that some of these areas that they had marked out on the map already would have incurred into Taiwanese territory. So it is, again, as I said, it is expected. Uh, the risk of miscalculation and an incident happening is still very high. Elizabeth Nirmal, thank you for the insights and perspectives. US Bureau Chief Nirmal Ghosh and China correspondent Elizabeth Law there. Our coverage of Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan continues on StraitsTimes.com and on Facebook as well as YouTube. Now don't forget to click subscribe to stay informed and activate the bell icon on YouTube to catch live news updates. I'm Hari Diman. thanks for watching.